thanks to Asia House and to the Barbary Foundation for having invited me to come here and speak this evening uh, on the subject of the sacred and the sensuous in the art of India, specifically today Hindu art, uh, as it's a subject that I'm currently researching and preparing a book-length uh, manuscript, perhaps in a year or two. Well, as you can see, the human form, both male and female, often provocatively poised, and frequently presented in eye-catching three-dimensional sculpture, is central to the art of Hindu India. The image on the right adorned the walls of a Hindu temple in northern India that was similar to this one at Kajiraho. Forgive me. Uh, and the bronze image on the left was commissioned in the year 1010 for ritual worship in a Chola temple dedicated to Shiva and similar to this one at Tanjavur. So the centrality of the human form in India's artistic tradition, this sensuous human bodily form, becomes apparent even with a casual acquaintance with the art of the subcontinent. You have but to glance through the pages of a book on Indian art or walk through any museum gallery display to be aware of the dominance of the sensuous human body. And this centrality sets the art of India quite distinctly apart from any other Asian tradition, for instance, those of China and Japan. Landscape, which was so important in the East Asian traditions, never resonated in India. If it played any role at all, it was only a setting for the human figures that were the focus. A few strokes might be used to set a forest scene or a cityscape in which an event occurred, but then it was always the human form that took center stage. Consider, for instance, these two portrayals. One of a teacher in the forest, the other of a poet on the mountaintop. In the Chinese example, the setting is emphasized at the expense of the human form, one almost has to search for the poet. The Indian example focuses on the human figure and merely adds branches of a tree behind and above the form and a deer and a serpent below to communicate the forest setting. In India, neither still life nor portraiture in the commonly understood meaning of that term held any importance. It was the complete human form. Tall, elegant, slender, sensuous. That was the leap motif. Now, the central position of the human form in art is reinforced in Indian poetic compositions, whether they be literary texts or inscriptions in verse that commemorate the gift of land or money to a Brahmin or to a temple. The glories of nature as also of man's creations. So that means the earth and sky, towns and gardens, temples and wells, are frequently visualized in human terms and compared to the beauty of the human physical form and human erotic love. In a stone inscription of 30 Sanskrit verses, composed during the reign of the 12th century Chedi prince, the earth and sky are described as embracing each other and then kissing a temple that is itself anticipating the closeness of the many women who will visit it. Here's what it says. First, gratified as it were, the close embrace of the thighs of the earth. The surrounding sky, like a clever lover, accompanying his action with a smile of love, eagerly kisses, as it were, the face of fortune, this temple. The temple itself, desirous of proceeding on all sides, the heavy embrace of bodies trembling with the pangs of love of the women of all the regions. The inscription was composed to record the gift of the Shiva temple near Nagpur. The images you have been gazing at decorate the walls of Hindu temples. Those on the left are from the Varmana Vishnu temple at Kajuraho in central India. The figure on the right is from the Nageshwara Shiva temple at Kumbakonam in Tamil Nadu. So, what exactly is the role of the temple? The Hindu temple is considered to be the home of the deity when he or she descends from an abstract state of transcendence to 
to take up temporary residence in an image that is enshrined within the sanctum. Priests perform a special ceremony of invocation, Aronam, inviting the deity to enter the stone or the bronze image in this case for the duration of ritual worship. And when worship is over, there is a ritual known as Visarjana, sending away, in which the priest informs the deity that it is now fine to leave the image. So when enlivened, the image contains a spark of the divine. At other times, it is treated as a mere piece of stone or metal. Hindus visit a temple for darshan, literally seeing. Seeing the image of the enshrined deity once it has been enlivened. Such seeing does not merely mean using one's eyes, but it's a very dynamic act of awareness. And it's this type of seeing that lies behind the choice of the word seer to designate a holy prophet or a sage. The deity, in presenting himself or herself for darshan, bestows blessings upon the worshippers who, by that act of seeing, have made themselves receptive to the transfer of grace. They've made themselves fit receptacles for the transfer of grace. And it is this concept of darshan that lies at the very heart of the creation of images of the divine and of temples to enshrine them. Images are thus a very central feature of the Hindu religious tradition. An ancient text, the Vishnu Samhita, persuasively argues for imagery. <coughs> this is what it says. Without a form, how can God be meditated upon? Where will the mind fix itself? When there is nothing for the mind to attach itself to, it will slip away from meditation, or will glide into a state of slumber. Therefore, the wise will meditate on some form. <clears throat> Let me commence my exploration of sensuous sacred imagery with bronze images of the Chola period in South India, the four centuries between the 9th and the 13th century. And I'd like to position the Chola images against the hymns composed by Tamil saints who lived between the 6th and the 9th century, so that their poems were being completed just as the first Chola images were beginning to be made. The bronze of God Shiva, as Nataraja or Lord of Dance, presents us within the bounds of a single form with both the sacred and the sensuous, categories that we normally think of as contradictory. Shiva's form is truly divine, an exquisite face, elegant torso, perfectly proportioned thighs and legs, gently curved yet tight behind. He is the beautiful dancing lord, whose dance is at the same time imbued with the deepest of philosophical significance. Specialists in the audience, forgive me if I somewhat oversimplify what Shiva does, but Shiva in this form when he dances his dance of bliss, dances the world into extinction, only to be created again through dance in India's largely cyclical concept of time. Fire in one hand signifies destruction. The drum in the other stands for creation. It is sound in the beginning of the sound, or you could say the word. The dwarf-like figure on whom Shiva stands is ignorance and darkness that must be destroyed. And Shiva's raised foot indicates deliverance, deliverance of the individual soul. It's a deeply sacred form, a form imbued with deep philosophy, yet one presented by the artists as a form of great physical beauty. The seventh century saint, Akbar, wrote this rapturous verse on the beauty of dancing Shiva. It was such a beautiful form that to him it made even rebirth on earth a thing worth having. And he sang, If you could see the arch of his brow, the budding smile on lips red as cobalt fruit, cool matted hair, the milk white ash on coral skin, and the sweet golden foot raised up in dance, 
then even human birth on this wide earth would become a thing worth having. In its original Tamil, it sounds this way. Kunita purgum, kobe shedvayil kumin shirpum, panita shanayum, pavlamho menil pal venirum, yinita muraya yelita ponpalum, kana petral, manila piraviye vengurude in the manila te. One of the standard approaches to the divine in the Indian path of devotion, known by the term bhakti, is through appreciation of beauty, appreciation of the sheer physical perfection of form. The idea being implicit that outer beauty is inextricably linked to inner spiritual beauty, that outer beauty expresses inner beauty. Here is a verse in which the beauty of Shiva seems to overwhelm saint, um, seventh century child saint Samana. He is the king, a shower of rain for the world, pure gold, first being, living in grove and circle of Pulamande. He is my very own, he is music, he is the light of the morning sun. His elder contemporary, seventh century saint Upper, also expresses love for the beautiful Shiva. And if you think that words like sugar and honey are today's terminology or American terminology, you're absolutely wrong. Just listen to this. Sugar, sweet syrup of sugar cane, bright one, brilliant as a lightning flash, golden one, my lord who glitters like a hill of gems. How should I forget him? Sugar cane, lump of sweet sugar candy, be in the fragrant flower, light that dwells in every flame. Our Lord who loves flower buds gathered at dawn, how should I forget him? Youth who shines as a ruby, as a cluster of emeralds, being who enters my heart, stirring memory. Somewhat parallel is the approach to Uma, the great goddess consort of Shiva. Uma is, is the term that's always used for her in the Tamil poems. She's, of course, also Bhagavati. Uh, she's invariably portrayed in art as a woman of great beauty, as in this image belonging to the mid 10th century. And we see a slender figure of sensuous modeling. Her breasts are softly sculpted, and the spread of her swelling stomach almost has the illusion of flesh as it contrasts with the details of the abundant jewelry that adorns her. The piece conveys a heightened awareness of form and a swaying sense of movement. The unabashedly sensual language used by the Tamil saints to describe Uma may come as a surprise to many. The, this sensuous visualization of the sacred form is well exemplified by Saint Sundara. Sundara lived right around the year 800. Uh, he sang a song which might have been addressed to an image like the one on the left in which Shiva is accompanied by Uma. Each verse commences with the words, Shiva passed this way, describes him, I'll admit those since I've already described Shiva, and it's followed by a phrase that describes Uma who accompanied Shiva. He passed this way with the young woman whose mound of Venus is like a cobra spreading hood. He passed this way together with the young woman whose soft breasts fill her taut bodice. He passed this way together with the woman whose smile is white as pearl. He passed this way, together with the woman perfectly adorned, whose mount of Venus is veiled in cloth. He passed this way, with the woman whose brow is the crescent moon. Describing the breasts of the goddess in sacred hymns, in the Tamil hymns, was far from taboo. Rather, it was considered an entirely appropriate tribute to her beauty. 7th century child Saint Samana sang thus of Uma's breasts. Fresh as newborn lotus buds, lustrous like kombu blossoms, honeyed like young coconuts, golden colors filled with the nectar of the gods are the breasts of the resplendent Uma. It's in this context, literary and religious, that we must place the sensuous visual imagery chosen to depict the sacred form. And we must conclude that patron, artist, and temple authorities 
all agreed that external beauty was a necessary marker of internal spiritual beauty. Nevertheless, the experience of beauty for the devotee was somewhat different from that of the art lover, and apparently different too from that visualized by the saints in their ecstatic tunnel verses. Devotees would have encountered the exquisitely sculpted bronze images in a ritual context, where the images would have been displayed after the process of alankara, or ritual adornment, that is an integral part of puja, of Hindu ritual devotion. Puja could be compared to the hospitality one would offer to a highly esteemed guest. It includes offerings of fresh flower garlands, new clothes, food, cool water, lamps, incense, music, one could think in terms of how one might welcome oneself, might welcome uh, an honored guest into one's home. You'd put out your finest linen and finest china, silverware, crystal glasses, you'd light candles, you'd pour wine, and you'd produce fine food. Hindu worship is anything but a withdrawal of the senses. Rather, puja sharpens the senses, all of them, and directs them solely towards the object of worship. So that puja involves seeing the deity, smelling incense and flowers, hearing the chants of worship and the chiming of bells, touching the feet of the image, tasting food sanctified by the deity. The, this act of alankara or adornment of the deity is a vital part of puja. <coughs> and it is only when this has been completed that devotees are actually invited to view the image and to receive darsha. So the experience of the devotee, exemplified by the image on the right, would be different from that of the museum visitor as seen on the left. Granted, the devotee could always see the image in its unadorned state, since the bronzes routinely sit unadorned in the hall immediately adjoining the sanctum of Shiva. They're there unadorned for anyone to look at. But when the image is specifically brought to the attention of devotees, it is in its adorned state. You might note, too, that the bronze images are already adorned in their metal glory. They have clothing and a rich array of necklaces, armlets, bracelets, garlands, earrings, crown, anklets, much more. But ornament is auspicious. Ornament is protective. Ornament makes the body complete, whole, beautiful, desirable. To be without ornament is to provoke the forces of inauspiciousness, to court danger, even to create danger. This adornment of already ornamented bronzes is not a recent phenomenon. For well over a thousand years, adorned bronze images were gifted sumptuous jewels for their further adornment. An inscription of around the year 1010, for instance, tells us that the thunder will bronze of Shiva as Tripura or victor of the three cities, which stood just under a meter tall, quite a lot tall image, was endowed with some 22 different gold jewels. Here's the list. One long garland strung with thalis and weighing over one pound. Four single strand necklaces set with pearls, coral, and lapis. A Sri Chanda ornament set with 2,524 pearls and weighing 1.2 pounds an elaborate hip girdle strung with 2,339 pearls with a clasp studded with diamonds and crystals and weighing almost one pound, a pair of earrings of dangling pearls, two armlets, eight bracelets, four anklets, and a gold scimitar. Ornament was suspicious, so you couldn't have too much of a good thing. But what about the sensuous stone images of deities on the exterior walls of temples, stone images that were never intended to be clothed or indeed ornamented, images that serve to reinforce the centrality of the deity enshrined within the temple and often to elaborate upon the myths that surrounded that deity? The walls of the Ambika Mata temple at Jagat near Udaipur is dedicated to Devi, the great goddess, and the walls feature a series of niches, all containing sculptures of her as the one who killed the buffalo demon, Mahishasura Mardini. 
Uh, each image, and you can see her centrally in the slide on the right. Each image portrays Devi as a life, elegant, supremely confident being, dealing effortlessly with the buffalo demon, who is sometimes shown in purely animal form, sometimes as half animal, half human, and sometimes as a human here emerging out of the neck of the buffalo. Each of the many images depicts her with a sensuous female form that some may regard as provocative, even seductive. And indeed, here is how she is described in the text of the Devi Mahatmya, which translates as the glory of the goddess. It's the text of seminal importance for Devi worship, a Sanskrit poem, perhaps the sixth century, that narrates her many battles. And here is how it describes her. A certain woman dwells there, exceptionally beautiful, causing the Himalayas to glow. Such a form has never been seen anywhere by anyone. She is a jewel among women, with the most beautiful limbs, illuminating all the directions with her luster. Images of God and goddess on the exterior walls of temples frequently portray them as a loving couple, rarely separated from each other. You see Shiva and Parvati on the left from the Achola temple at Gange called Achola Puram, which is northeast of Tanjavur. And on the right, you see Vishnu and Lakshmi from Kajurago in central India. We've seen that one easy mode of approach to the divine was through reveling in adoring the beauty of the bodily form of the divine. Another, apparently, was through celebrating the divinity's enjoyment of erotic love. And this is brought home through the vast corpus of inscriptions, which are found either as copper plate charters or as epigraphs on pillars, rocks, and slabs of stone incorporated into monuments. These various grants normally commence with one or two verses in praise of the deity. And these verses frequently describe the bodily beauty of the gods and also their amorous activities in, again, unexpectedly sensual language. Here, for instance, is the Ratnapur stone inscription of the year 1163. It's near Bilaspur. It commences with this verse in praise of God Shiva, who has a third eye in the center of his forehead, as we all know. And it says, May the divine half-moon-crested Shiva increase your welfare. He who has three eyes, as if because of his desire to see simultaneously, at the time of playful amorous enjoyment, the pair of gold pitcher-like breasts and the lotus face of Parvati, daughter of the mountain. To conjure up such a reason for Shiva's third eye is indeed an amazing conceit. And then it's also there all over in Sanskrit Kavya. For instance, Kalidasa's Kumara Samava, maybe of the, around the year 400, which likewise celebrates the love of Shiva and Parvati. Its eighth canto, currently its last, entitled The Description of Uma's Pleasure, consists of 91 verses describing the lovemaking of the divine couple over a period of 25 years. Verses such as the new bride's discomfiture may have provided the inspiration for the inscriptional eulogy I just read to you. And this is what it says about the young bride, Parvati. Alone together, before she would let the robe fall, she would cover Shiva's eyes with both palms. But she was left troubled then by that useless effort as the third eye in his forehead looked down at her. Uh, the Kumara Sambhava allegedly deals with the birth of Kumara, but it's a subject that it never gets to, suggesting that probably Kalidasa left that work unfinished. But my point is, it's apparent that the love of Shiva and Uma and their delight in each other's physical beauty was a matter for joyous celebration. It was a feature that a monarch was proud to proclaim as the invocatory stanza to his own inscription, an inscription that recorded his generosity to a granite or his construction of a grand temple. Love and beauty were hailed and fetid, rather than being a subject not to be spoken of publicly. And images of the deities, um, and here again, another two images, a chola bronze on the right, and a stone image from the temple at Mele Kalamur, a chola temple, 
the images of the deities demonstrating their love for each other were equally celebrated on the walls of ancient temples. So when does an object of devotion become a work of art to be displayed on a pedestal in a museum? I raise this as you gaze at front and rear views of the Krishna grouping from my recent exhibition on Chola Brahmas. It's true that museums displays isolate and transfer objects from their original setting, and in so doing, it invests them with new meaning as a work of art. Scholars refer to the museum effect that turns cultural materials into works of art. And some speak of the resulting drastic recontextualization. To my way of thinking, this is not a troubling phenomenon. Even though most South Asian sculpture is sacred imagery that was created to be approached with devotion. And a scholar like Richard Davis, a religionist, actually argues that subsequent reinterpretations of India's art objects, particularly images of the gods, are as worthy of study as their original intent and context. He may or may not agree, but that's what he says. And a scholar like Philip Fisher comments on art objects surviving recontextualization, and he compares it with the immigrant's experience in saying um, how art objects survive recontextualization in the way that certain personalities survive and even thrive under the strain to personality that immigration imposes. It's, however, useful to remind oneself that most collections of Indian art, especially of its sculpture, whether in museums or private hands, consist of objects whose primary aim was not to arouse admiration of their aesthetic quality. Um, a popular exhibition at the Sackler, where I spent eight years, was titled Puja, Aspects of Hindu Devotion. It displayed objects of cultural and ritual significance, both from the angle of the devotee and from that of the art lover. It was a compact exhibition, it was tripartite, and it presented a temple shrine to Shiva, a home shrine to Vishnu, and a wayside shrine to the goddess. And each of them was presented first as a simulated sacred, in a simulated sacred context, and then juxtaposed with each of the three in-situ displays was a standard museum-style presentation of similar objects treated as works of art. Thus, the temple shrine section of the exhibit commenced with the Shiva Linga dressed and adorned and placed within a shrine with trays of devotional offerings. The adjoining room provided a total contrast by displaying lingas and mukhalingas as works of art. The exhibition proposed that its objects possessed equal validity in two very different contexts. As objects of devotion, they are intended entirely for ritual worship and adoration. Beauty is irrelevant. On the other hand, they have today acquired an equally valid existence as works of art. And as such, they were placed on pedestals in a strikingly lit museum display with an ambience quite different, you would agree, from the original context. Uh, an unanticipated byproduct of this exhibition, and one that was for me a very satisfying experience, was to hear clusters of young teens, I mean 13 and 14, of South Asian origin in the Puja exhibit, whispering to each other, their parents too had objects similar to these on a kitchen shelf or in the bedroom, and that perhaps it was okay after all if the Smithsonian put such things on display. <laughs> so museum exhibitions may transform objects so that their original functions and intentions are either diminished, sometimes harsh critics may say marginalized. In presenting in a gallery space an exquisite image of a god that once adorned a temple niche, the museum embeds the image in a new story. It's a new narrative. It could be a stylistic evolution over time. It could be the study of, of specific sacred imagery. It could be the analysis of the art of a specific geographical region. But this new narrative has been chosen in order to communicate the relevance of an image or an object to a viewer 
generally usually unfamiliar with the original context. Museums today certainly have multiple functions. They are first and foremost storehouses or treasure houses that serve as secular temples, and I use that word intentionally, as visitors in museums often speak in hushed tones. But museums certainly are, and they have to be, educational instruments that communicate with audiences. The ability of art objects in appropriate museum settings to arouse wonder is something that museologists capitalize on, frequently using theatrical tactics in presenting exhibitions. I personally offer no apology for using what some call boutique lighting to make the images of the deities glow and sparkle in this manner. To my mind, it was a totally appropriate way to suggest to viewers that they might view the multiplicity of divine images as multiple sparkling facets of a single diamond as Hindus sometimes do. I'd like to speak briefly of another exhibition that was mentioned earlier, Devi the Great Goddess. In their original context, most of the images in Devi were neither intended to be portable objects nor to be viewed as art. But history has decreed that they take on a new persona in which they are highly valued objects of aesthetic significance. Any exhibition creates a structured path, an imposed order, sort of a programmed narrative. Images are juxtaposed in specific ways, and they often take on new meanings when viewed in relation to specific other works. There's usually only one way to enter an exhibition and one way to leave, and here you see the entry and the exit of the daily exhibition. Specific meanings are constructed by placing images early or late in an exhibit, before this image or after that one, or standing in, in splendid isolation, as in the case of this wonderful Anish Kapoor blue fiberglass piece on Delhi. The, the whole path, the wall with its juxtapositions, the rooms with its cluster, they're all tiny narratives or histories. And they all build up into the experience of the visit to this exhibition. In any exhibition, the material is filtered through the interests of the curator. And in the case of Bailey, the exhibition is structured by my distinct interests, sensibilities, and biases. The Bailey exhibition by another curator would certainly have a different structure. And that's as it should be and shouldn't seem strange, since something very similar happens when academics write a book. There is a first chapter and a last, and an idea is presented before this one or after that one, and the various chapters in place of the various rooms build into the experience of the book. And two scholars writing about the same subject are likely to come up with two different books. The choice of material, the approach, the emphasis, whether in a book or in an exhibition, is all important. Now, the complex nature of the subject of Devi made me intensely aware that I was going to have to guide the viewer through what was indeed a cultural obstacle course. So apart from impressing visitors with the sheer beauty of the objects and the overwhelming significance of the goddess, there were two thoughts I wished to convey to those who were willing to engage deeper. First, I wanted them to come to terms with the paradoxical nature of the goddess. She is Ma mother, that most approachable of beings, gentle, nurturing, concerned with her children's every needs. At the same time, she is Jagan Mata, mother of the universe, an awesome being of great power, remote, fearsome, and difficult to approach. I hope that visitors would accept this paradox through viewing a range of beautiful images that express the one aspect or the other, and in some instances, as in the case of the Anish Kapoor that started the show, in some instances combine the two aspects into one image. The second thought that I wish to impart to the more serious visitor was posed in the form of a question. Is Devi one? Is she many? Is she one through and in the many? I want this question to resonate throughout the exhibition, 
but I didn't propose to, propose to answer it as any answer would be an oversimplification. Let me move to another facet of the sacred architecture of Hindu India. The manner in which sacred and profane are not segregated, separated, demarcated, <coughs> or put into distinct different categories, but rather share the same spatial boundaries. For instance, they sit side by side upon temple walls. Um, when I use the word profane, I'm using it in its original meaning of outside the temple, meaning non-sacred from the Latin pro in front of and found in temple, so I just mean non-sacred. Hindu temples such as those at Kaduraho of the 11th century that you're looking at were routinely decorated with both images of the gods and with curvaceous figures of women. The origins of this latter practice lie in the primacy accorded to the concept of fertility in ancient India. In India, fertility implied growth, abundance, and prosperity. By woman's biological link with fertility, woman too suggested growth, abundance, and prosperity. To emphasize this link, artists actually needed to emphasize wide childbearing hips and ample breasts. And this association with fertility finally led to women becoming a sign of the auspicious, together with the couple, an obvious emblem of fertility, and overflowing foliage, another obvious emblem of fertility. And it's this factor, women becoming a sign of the auspicious, that in large measure explains the ubiquitous presence of women on the sacred monuments of India. We have an 11th century Orissan art text. It's called the Shilpa Prakasha. And it provides guidelines for practicing temple architects and sculptors. And it categorically states that figures of women, Nadi Banda, is indispensable in architecture. And it proceeds to say, here are its words, as a house without a wife, as frolic without women, so without the figure of woman, the monument will be of inferior quality and will bear no fruit. The text then proceeds to list 16 types of women who best decorate a temple. And it instructs the sculptor how exactly to carve these figures within the confines of an upright rectangle, which he was to divide according to a specified grid. Remember that this was for practicing projects and sculptors. You might be interested in the list of 16. Women could be portrayed relaxed and indolent, Anasa. Stand behind a door, Thorana. She could look into a mirror, Dalparna, as in both of these cases, this is a round metal mirror. Smell a lotus, Padmaganda. Adorn herself with Ketaki flowers, Ketaki Banda. Or garland herself with a branch, Dalamanika. She could be young and innocent, Mukta. Haughty and offended, Manini. Pensive, vinyasa, or bashful, guntala. And in the case of the guntala, the sculptor is instructed that he should always portray her with her rear view to the viewer. In other words, she's turning away bashfully. She could play with a parrot, shukasarika, be a dancer, nartaki, or a drummer, mantala, adjust her anklets, nupura parika, or hold a fly whisk, chamara. And she could also be a mother with child infant in her arms, Matri Murti, and uh, uh, apologize for the fact that uh, the slides that I've chosen, the child, the infant, seems to be damaged in both cases. Walls of the temples in northern India display all of these 16 types, and additional images such as woman playing with a ball, or fastening her skirt, shooing away a monkey, indicating the existence of textual variants. By this date, which is the 11th century, it's clear that that potency of woman's fertility and its equation with growth, abundance, and prosperity had led to woman becoming a sign of the auspicious. So far, we've been looking at North India. One sees similar female imagery in the South. For instance, in the Hoysala temples of the Karnataka, such as this one, the Chenna Kesava temple at Beirut. Here the images take the form of decorative brackets. They're placed high above under the eave of the roof, 
rather than being carved along the walls of the temples. But these bracket images were by no means given secondary importance by the sculptors. The same sculptors who carved the images of the deities on the walls of the temple, like Dancing Devi on the left, also vied with each other in producing the finest bracket figures, like the auspicious woman as dancer on the right. And of course, South India also had temples with female images carved on the temple walls themselves. <coughs> Witness this sensuous imagery on the walls of a small shrine called the Venugopala, which is in the fourth enclosure of the great temple at Sri Rangam near Tichnapuri. Sixty years ago, Stella Kramrich, that extraordinary scholar of Indian art, wrote, the art of India is neither religious nor secular, for the consistent fabric of Indian life was never rent by the Western dichotomy of religious belief and worldly practice. She was absolutely right. Let me introduce you to a remarkable monument that illustrates dramatically the impossibility of separating the sacred from the profane in the Indian context. It's a monument uncovered in recent years. It's at Patan in the state of Gujarat, and it's the Queen's Stepwell, built around the year 1065. This is an arid zone, and stepwells were dug deep into the ground, providing water for the township, a cool shelter from the blazing noonday sun, and serving also as a sort of sarai, an overnight resting spot for travelers. It was a descent to plenty. It's an enormous underground structure, this one, in seven subterranean levels. It measures 215 feet in length, it's some 70 feet across, and has 300 or so ornamented pillars. It clearly served a practical purpose. It even incorporates an overflow tank for surplus water. But there is much more to the Queen's step well. It is covered with sculpted images, both sacred and non-sacred of which some 400 survive. This is the terrace on the third level, and it portrays images of Hindu god Vishnu in each of his ten avatars, five on this wall, five on the opposite wall that you'll see in a moment, indicating that the utilitarian character of the well was supplemented by a sacred aspect. And then, as if subverting that intent, each avatar, and on the right you see a detail of Vishnu as the great snouted boar, Varaha, who rescues the earth. Each avatar is separated from the next by slender, vivacious, provocatively poised figures of women who have nothing to do with the mythology of Vishnu. Rather, they represent the auspicious female whose figures need, needed to be carved on any monument made with art, according to the Shilpa Prakasha. And here, the opposite wall, and a detail on the right of the 10th avatar, the Kalki avatar, the one yet to come, similarly flanked. Of some 400 surviving sculpted images, 200, a full half, are of sensuous female figures. The circular well shaft is also covered with figures of gods. And prior to place, right down the center, you may be just able to see it, it's slightly out of focus. Prior to place is given to God Vishnu, who is shown slumbering upon his serpent couch on the primordial waters prior to the creation of the world. The Vishnu image is repeated on three levels of the well. Here you can see two of the three levels. It would appear that the queen and her architects tried to ensure that regardless of the level of the water table, whether it rose or fell, Vishnu's serpent couch would always rest upon the waters, much as is the standard way in which such imagery is dramatically recreated within tanks in Nepal. By the way, this monument was not open to the sky as it is today on the left, but it was covered, as you see on the right, in an intact but somewhat smaller step well in the same region. Here is a monument that effectively and imaginatively combines a functional element like water, which is of enormous importance in the arid regions of India, 
with appropriate sacred mythology and also with sensuous images of women to produce a structure that defies any neat classification. It's a sort of seamless weave of sensuous and sacred, practical and religious. Part of the explanation of the lack of dichotomy between worldly and otherworldly imagery lies perhaps in the Hindu visualization of man's life and world in the world as a journey with four connected and graded aims or goals. We start with it's, uh, the goals start with dharma, laws of human righteousness, moves to artha, accumulated wealth, then karma, the basis of love and passion, and concludes with moksha, or ultimate release from this world. And this concept goes hand in hand with the four successive stages of ashramas of life. The student life, brahmacharya, the married state, grihastha, the phase when the recluse withdraws from active participation in worldly affairs, vanaprastha, and finally the life of the renunciant, sannyasin. All four goals of man and all four stages of life were considered to have its rightful place in every individual's life. And the ancient religious texts allow each one to experience the four in succession. Karma or love was not to be bypassed in favor of moksha. In fact, the texts state that the marriage state of grahastha is the stage that allows the greatest scope for individuals to cultivate the quality qualities that are necessary to make a success, not just of the pleasures of love, karma, and wealth, artha, lived by the rules of dharma, but it also enables them to achieve eligibility for the final stage of moksha. Chai Singh Samadha, whom I quoted earlier, writing towards the end of the 7th century, is laid stress on this very aspect when he sang thus. Here on this good earth, you may lead a life of joy, living each day in fullness. Indeed, this hinders not the goal of liberation. In the green and plenteous plains of Shirkari, thus too did Lord Shiva dwell beside him, the fairest of women. This holistic attitude towards life made its impact on both art and literature. Sculptural and verbal imagery pertaining to the four goals found a rightful place in both sacred and worldly contexts. And it's very evident on the walls of sacred structures. And here you're looking at the Lingaraj temple and the detail on the right where you can see one of the figures of women on the walls. A uh, Hindu shrine may be intended primarily to instill awareness of the final goal of salvation, but they were not intended to instigate renunciation of the other goals. It was considered quite proper that a sacred structure carry images pertaining to all the four goals of life. This world view that sees no dichotomy between religious belief and worldly practice prevailed from at least the second century BCE to the 16th century of this era, and even later. The problems involved in handling the sacred and sensuous arise from the point of the here and now as against the there and then. Few viewers today are really comfortable with the idea of a lack of dichotomy between worldly and otherworldly. Fewer still accept comfortably the sensuous nature of India's artistic tradition, whether it is expressed as sculpture and painting or as poetry and prose. And as one looks into it, it's clear that more recent Indian history provides a partial explanation. 1,800 years of the lack of dichotomy has been overlaid by something like 500 years of domination, first by ruling Muslim dynasties, followed by British colonialism. Both cultures that emphasize a sharp distinction between worldly and otherworldly. I'm not suggesting that Muslim or British rule made any conscious effort to change the prevailing worldview. Rather, the cultural aura changed gradually by the very fact of being surrounded by the imperceptible, insinuating influence of a completely different worldview, to say nothing of totally different lifestyles. And this has resulted in the mindset of today's Indian, including myself. 
we have learned to accept or explain away and be comfortable with most of the contradictions and inconsistencies of the original faiths, faiths which gave rise to sensuous verbal and visual imagery. But most of us are still uncomfortable with the imagery itself and find it difficult to accept or explain. But it's in the ancient milieu, sociocultural, literary, and artistic, that, that it is that milieu that we have to recall, must recall, in order to contextualize the visual imagery chosen to depict that sacred form. And once we do that, we may conclude that the sensuous beauty of physical form was an indispensable marker of the abstract formless beauty of spirit. And that it seems to have been held that experiencing the one, the sensuous beauty of physical form, would lead to the other, to the appreciation of the abstract formless beauty of spirit. In the artistic tradition of India, the sensuous and the sacred are not contradictory nor irreconcilable categories. Rather, they overlap and intermingle. Thank you.